Hey everyone, uh, today's set of notes we are going to be starting to look at the topic of pathogens. So in reference to your study design, the dot point that we're going to be covering, um, just a small part of it today and then the rest of it will be filled in in future videos. We're looking specifically at the distinction between cellular and non-cellular pathogens. So what is a pathogen? Um, a definition for those of you who are keen to write one down, I've got one on the screen there. So pathogens are an agent that is able to cause a disease within an organism after infection. Um, some key things that I wanted to point out to you, the reason this definition doesn't say something such as um, a cell or a living organism that is able to cause disease within another organism is because pathogens aren't always um, cellular organisms okay so typically when we think of pathogens most of the time we think of these cellular organisms so meaning that they contain living cells one or more of them and the typical example we think of is usually a bacteria which is an example of a prokaryote so yes all of these things can cause um, infections and are examples of pathogens but there is also another side of pathogens that we need to be aware of and that is the non-cellular side okay so the part the right hand side of the diagram here so that pathogens that fall into the non-cellular or non-living category are pathogens that are not made of cells so for example a virus and um, also something known as a prion or a prion doesn't really matter how you pronounce it both of these are examples of pathogens that do not actually or they're not made of cells. So they don't have things like ribosomes, mitochondria, um, chloroplast, plasma membranes, any of that. Um, they're made of different substances. And the key difference between cellular and non-cellular pathogens as cellular pathogens replicate on their own. Oops on their own whereas non-cellular must have a host to replicate so that means pretty much that if we're looking at for example a tapeworm or a particular bacteria or a particular type of fungus any of those cellular pathogens don't actually need to be inside a host organism so they don't need to have infected a human to be able to replicate they can replicate on their own either through binary fission like in bacteria or it might be using some form of mitosis in the eukaryotic pathogens whereas our non-cellular pathogens things like the viruses and the prions they actually need to be within a host so they need to have infected a living organism and they will then use that living organisms machinery to help them replicate. They cannot replicate on their own. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at a couple of pathogen examples in a little bit more detail. The most common ones that we come across. So looking at bacteria and viruses. Let's have a look at them more closely now. All right, let's talk about bacteria for a little bit. Um, we already know that bacteria are prokaryotic organisms which means that they don't have any membrane membrane bound organelles. They have uh, circular DNA. Um, they also have ribosomes within their cells to help them with uh, protein synthesis. Some other bits of information that you should be able to recognize in terms of bacteria um, is that they can fall into two categories. So those categories are gram positive or gram negative bacteria. Um, and this is just a fancy distinction that scientists tend to use to split these bacteria into um, separate groups so that we can treat people that have been infected with either group of bacteria in a much more effective way. So uh, if we're looking at the example of a gram positive bacteria, when we look at a bacterial cell that is gram positive, they're going to have a plasma membrane plasma membrane, sorry, and a cell wall or a peptidoglycan cell wall. Peptidoglycan is just a chemical that the cell wall of a bacteria is made up of. You don't need to know that in too much detail. But gram-positive gram bacteria have their plasma membrane, yeah, and they also have a cell wall, okay? So essentially two layers. 
Our gram-negative bacteria are a little bit different. They're a little bit more complex. So they have their regular plasma membrane that all cells do have. They also have that cell wall, that peptidoglycan cell wall, but they actually have a third layer, an outer membrane, an outer shell, if you will, that um, I'm highlighting now. And that offers them an extra layer of protection. It also gives them an extra function, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but really, you need to be, from this information, taking away the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So gram-positive have two layers, gram-negative have three. So why are bacteria so dangerous, I guess, to us as humans? We know that they can infect us, cause infections, which causes bad things to happen in our body, but how are they actually doing that? Well, um, all bacteria have the ability to release toxins from inside their cells to outside their cells and cause harm to the host. So these toxins that they are releasing from inside their cells to outside their cells, as seen in this diagram here, we refer to them as exotoxins because these I guess one way of remembering it is exotoxins exit the bacteria cell and they're now interacting with our cells. Um, so depending on what the exotoxin is, that's going to cause those signs and symptoms that we can experience depending on what bacteria we um, are infected with. And of course, there are bacteria out there that do not produce any harmful exotoxins to us, so they actually don't um, cause any harm to us. The other thing that some bacteria can do, actually, before I go into that, our exotoxins, um, it doesn't matter whether the bacteria is gram negative or gram positive. So, gram negative and gram positive can both release um, exotoxins. But the second type of toxin, an endotoxin, this can only be created or released by a gram-negative bacteria. So the gram-negative bacteria were the ones that had that third layer on the outside of them. So they had their plasma membrane, they had their cell wall, and then they had that extra third layer of protection. So not only does it give it extra protection, but if this bacteria... Um, is somehow killed, so it dies, they have this inbuilt mechanism, which is pretty cool, that causes that third layer, that lipopolysaccharide layer, to break down and form a toxin that is then released into that organism it has infected. Okay, so the bacteria has died, but they have the ability to still cause harm to the host to the human if they've infected a human. Um, really nasty mechanism, but I guess that's a kind of cool thing that's evolved in these types of bacteria. So exotoxins are released by both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria while they are alive, causing hosts to the cells. But endotoxins are only released by gram-negative gram bacteria so the ones with the three layers around them, the plasma membrane, the cell wall, and then that third lipopolysaccharide layer. And they will only release these endotoxins once the bacterial cell has died. Viruses, the first of our non-living or acellular pathogens. Remember that means that they are not technically a cell they were never alive. They can't perform functions on their own. They don't have, you know, things like ribosomes and um, other mechanisms to help themselves replicate. These non-living pathogens actually require a host to be able to replicate. Okay, so they hijack host cells machinery to help replicate any DNA or RNA that is contained within the virus, okay? They cannot, cannot replicate on their own. They need to rely on their host to do that. So essentially what a virus is made up of is they have a nucleic acid inside them, usually DNA or, it's DNA or RNA, they're the only two options, 
And that DNA or RNA, the nucleic acid, is surrounded by a protein shell called a capsid. Um, most people recognize a typical back, uh, sorry, a typical virus shape or structure looking something like this weird funky, reminds me of um, like a probe sent to Mars, you know, a spaceship type thing. Anyway, so we've got our nucleic acid. You can see in this little image up here, the little squiggly blue stuff. And then our protein shell or our capsid is the gray stuff surrounding it. That virus needs to somehow insert that DNA or RNA, the nucleic acid, inside the protein shell into the host cell. This diagram in the top right hand corner is giving you a very simplified depiction of what happens. So we have our virus here attaching to our host cell. It's injecting its nucleic acid into the host cell here. Uh, that nucleic acid gets mixed around with the host DNA um, and the host mistakenly starts to replicate that DNA. Once that re DNA is replicated, it can then undergo transcription and translation. And we know that transcription and translation um, is used to synthesize proteins. So in this part, we have our host cell performing transcription and translation on the virus DNA that was inserted into its cell. And as a result, it's actually creating those virus proteins that make up the protein shell of the capsid. When enough of it is made, we then get our virus being assembled inside the host cell or multiple viruses being assembled inside the host cell and when it reaches its capacity, those viruses are then able to be released from the host cell. When they are released, they then go on, go on to attach to a new host cell and infect that host cell and the cycle just continues. So it can actually be quite a quick process when someone has been infected by a virus for it to continue that spread through a person's body. Main takeaways from this. Viruses are non-living. They cannot replicate on them, by themselves. They must infect a host and they rely on the host to replicate for them. Viruses are made of a protein shell or capsid and inside that protein shell or capsid we have our nucleic acids. And the last pathogen that I'm going to discuss with you guys is the prion or the prion. Um, which is another example of a non-living pathogen. A prion is just, um, actually it's really simple and kind of scary, a misfolded protein. So they were once regular proteins that you would find within that organism, but for some reason it has become misfolded and this misfolded protein um, has become a form that is damaging to the body. That misfolding was caused by changes to the secondary structure, so the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets of the protein, um, which obviously in the, then in turn is going to affect, affect its tertiary structure. That protein can no longer do its normal job, but it might have a new job, and that new job is causing harm to the individual that this misfolded protein is in. Really, really scary thing about prions is once you have one in your system it is very easy for them to trigger a chain reaction to cause the regular version of that protein to misfold and then create more misfolded proteins that are now pathogens okay so they spread via a chain reaction you can see that in the diagram over here so it started off being the blue normal protein the diseased or pathogenic prion is the one in red. The red one comes in contact with the blue one and the blue one is now changed into a pathogenic version of it. Okay, so now we've got two pathogen or two prions that are pathogens. They then go on each to interact with the regular folded protein. And we're now doubling the amount of misfolded 
proteins or doubling the amount of prions that we have in this individual. Um, kind of scary how quickly that can happen. The other reason that this particular pathogen is so scary is because these proteins were once structures that belonged to your body. They came from your body before they were misfolded. Okay, They were created in the correct form and they're now misfolded. And that is so scary because these proteins, your body recognizes them as belonging to themselves. So they actually, your body doesn't actually detect that there's anything wrong with these proteins. The only way people can be diagnosed as being infected with prions is um, it's usually too late to do anything about the disease that they're causing. So some of the diseases that are caused by them, I've got some examples here. You might have, um, well, most people have heard of mad cow before. Um, it was huge back in the United Kingdom and Europe uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, where there was a misfolded protein or a prion that occurred in cows um, and that then transmitted to humans and misfolded certain proteins in humans causing what we now know as mad cow disease. Um, still referring to a misfolded protein, the misfolded protein is a human protein um, but it is essentially undetectable until you are exhibiting the signs and the symptoms of this disease. And when you get to the stage where you're exhibiting signs and symptoms of those diseases, um, all doctors can do for you is try and treat you to slow the progression of that disease. Most prion diseases, when they take effect on your body, they will affect your central nervous system, so the functioning of your nerve cells, um, your brain. You lose the ability to control your body, you can't think properly. Um, sometimes people with this can get confused with having or being diagnosed with something like dementia or Alzheimer's where that also affects your brain and it's not until they do brain scans and blood tests and that sort of thing that they actually determine, hang on, no, you actually have mad cow or one of the other prion diseases that can um, affect humans. So take home message for prions. They are misfolded proteins. Um, they, I guess, become contagious because if one misfolded protein interacts with the normal version of that protein, it can automatically trigger a chain reaction and cause it to misfold. And that'll be through chemical interactions. You guys don't need to know the details of that. Uh, the other thing that's probably quite important to recognize is that because these misfolded proteins were produced by a person's body or produced by a human body, there's no way for a human body to, to, to detect them as being foreign or a pathogen or not belonging. The body recognizes them as just a regular protein. It doesn't recognize that there's anything wrong with it and therefore your body doesn't try and stop this protein from causing more damage or misfolding more proteins.